Hello, I'm Brian Murphy speaking to you from my office in Southern California. The purpose of this video is to provide a clear and irrefutable demonstration that Pope Benedict XVI did not validly renounce the office of the papacy in February 2013, and is therefore still the Pope. As Catholics, we have always believed and still do believe that there is a God, that he is the creator of all, that his Son became incarnate to save mankind, that he died and rose from the dead, and that he founded the one true religion for the salvation of all, the Catholic Church. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He is the only head of the Church. However, to protect his flock from false shepherds and ravenous wolves, he gave to Simon Barjona a most stupendous gift, the office of being his vicar on earth. And he promised to the man who holds that office that he would never lose the faith, and that whatsoever he bound on earth would be bound in heaven. These are tremendous promises from a tremendous God. The office of Peter, therefore, is not something customary, traditional, or merely useful. It is a gift from the mouth of the living incarnate God, to help us keep faithful and to protect the Church from the gates of the netherworld. To know who the Pope is, therefore, is a necessity of faith and communion. For if we get that wrong, we will end up following a false shepherd. This is why the Church gives us canon law, to tell us when and under what conditions a man becomes the true Pope, and when and under what conditions a true Pope resigns. Perhaps you are mystified about there being two Popes in the Vatican, about Benedict's continued wearing of white, wearing the papal ring, bearing and signing the papal name Benedict, living in the Vatican, giving apostolic blessings which only the Pope can do, and so on. At the same time, you may be looking on in dismay as the man who appears to be the current Pope, Francis, or Cardinal Bergoglio, is driving the Catholic Church over a cliff with his promotion of sacrilegious communions, denial of the natural law validity of the death penalty, promotion of pagan idolatry, and his overall globalist, Freemasonic, one-world religion agenda instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a serious issue. It is a great affront to the divine justice and a danger to souls to believe the Pope is not the Pope and to follow someone else as if he were Pope. Every Catholic needs to get their allegiance right. It is demonstrable from canon law that Benedict never validly resigned the office in February of 2013. The ministry, yes, but not the office of the papacy. We shall see that this distinction is crucial to understand why Benedict is still Pope, and Francis, Cardinal Bergoglio, is thereby an anti-Pope with no authority whatsoever in the Church. Why is Pope Benedict XVI's resignation invalid? To understand this, we need to look at Benedict's act of renunciation of the 11th of February 2013. The principal problem with this act is that at no point does Benedict announce that he is renouncing the office of the papacy. The Latin word for office is munis, which also translates to honor or duty. In contrast, he only announces that he is renouncing the ministry. Why is this distinction important? because what you do not renounce, you still keep. For the renunciation of the papacy to be valid, the man who was Pope has to explicitly renounce the office by name. This is stated quite explicitly in the 1983 Code of Canon Law, Canon 332.2. Hence, Benedict's act of renunciation does not fulfill the conditions of a resignation of the papacy and is therefore invalid. Being invalid, Benedict remains Pope until he renounces the office or departs this life. Now, you may be wondering, why speak like this in 2019? Why did nobody speak about it in 2013, before Bergoglio was elected? Is our assertion perhaps a contrived retreat from the horrors of an evil but valid Pope? No. In fact, as soon as Benedict's act of renunciation came out on February 11, 2013, the Italian and French press, within a day, both printed doubts about the validity of the resignation text. Additionally, Professor Radelli in Italy 
wrote to Benedict warning him that an antipope would be elected in his place if he went through with this step. So our assertion is in no way a contrived retreat from reality as the defendants of Bergoglian, the Bergoglian regime would accuse. Let's look at some popular objections to our assertion of invalidity, put forward in defense of the validity of Benedict's resignation. Probably the most common error put forward to claim that Benedict validly resigned is the assertion that the immunus or office is to all intents and purposes the same as the ministerium. They say that Benedict did in fact resign validly. This position is demonstrably wrong from canon law which defines ministry and office in two separate canons. We will point out that apologists for Bergoglio will never address these canonical definitions, appealing instead to popular Latin dictionaries. However, the only valid definitions are those defined within canon law. Another objection to our claim is to say that the Pope is above canon law and can resign any way he likes. There are two errors here. The first error is to disregard the mind of the legislator in promulgating canon law. The canon covering papal resignation was codified by Pope John Paul II in 1983. Now it is true that Benedict as Pope is the supreme legislator of the Church, but first he has to actually legislate. Since in this case he did not, canon 332.2 remains valid. Benedict could have issued a derogation from this canon in resigning, but again he did no such thing, and as such he remains subject to its ruling. Note too that the act of renunciation was the act of Benedict as the man who was Pope, not a juridical act of the Pope. The second error is the disregard for the nature of the office as established by Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God established the Petrine office upon one man, not to be divided or split among more than one. Canon law, based as it is on divine law, must for validity reflect the will of Christ. Benedict created the situation where there are two popes, one holding the office and the other delegated to ministry. This is contrary to the will of Christ. So the Pope just can't resign any way he likes. Detailed canonical explanations are available for anyone who is interested at this website posted on the screen. In contrast to these objections, the clear canonical tradition indicates a mention of munis, or one of its synonyms, in the renunciation of an office, but no mention of ministry. Given this information, a Catholic is required to submit to canon law and presume that Benedict never in fact resigned the office of Pope and is therefore still Pope. Another objection to our assertion is to say that the Cardinals act as if the resignation were valid. However, acting as if it were valid does not make it valid. Acting as if a canon, in this case canon 332.2, were fulfilled does not mean it was fulfilled. A similar objection to our assertion proposes that the fact that a conclave took place in March of 2013 is proof that Benedict's resignation was valid. No. Firstly, that the Cardinals met in March of 2013 does not mean the conclave was valid. Indeed, by canon law, a conclave may not be convoked while the seat of Peter is still occupied. Thus, merely having a group of cardinals gathered in secret does not mean the conclave is valid. And obviously a conclave of dubious validity cannot be used to validate Benedict's resignation, as this is circular reasoning. One would be saying Benedict's resignation was valid because there was a conclave, and the conclave was valid because Benedict resigned. Rather, we must look to canon law. Canon 188 says Benedict's resignation was invalid because of substantial error. So any conclave convoked while he still lives is invalid. Another objection to our assertion is that Benedict called for a conclave in his act of renunciation, so he must have resigned. No, for validity, according to canon law, Benedict had to renounce the munis, which he did not do. 
he also, being still the occupant of the seat of Peter, could not by divine law call for a conclave to be held in his lifetime. Yes, he consented to this, but this has no bearing on the invalidity of his renunciation, since Simunus was omitted from the resignation statement. We point out another error here of the Bregolian apologists who say Benedict resigned in such a way that a conclave be called, thereby showing intent. However, something as important as a resignation cannot be reliably judged based on intent. Who will judge intent? Canon law makes no provision for someone to judge intent. Such a process would be mischievously invisible to the worldwide church. Intent does not make the seat vacant. Words are required. Similarly, the intent to give up the act of ministry does not vacate the seat either. Many people wonder how rigorously canon law should be applied. They think, oh well, Benedict intended to resign, the Holy Spirit was there, everything worked out, we got a new Pope and all is well. One ought not to get caught up in the rigorous details of law. We say, be careful. The Holy Spirit does not condone breaking the law. Circumventing the law is an act of man, not the Holy Spirit. So, a fundamental question is, how much legal rigor should be applied to processes that change the papacy? We can gain insight into this question by looking at a parallel example from an entirely different field. I am an entrepreneur working in a business that manages clinical trials for new drugs being manufactured and tested by a pharmaceutical company. The principal guiding document in any clinical trial is the clinical protocol. Just like canon law has been edited and adjusted for centuries, the protocol is edited and adjusted for months by many subject experts, MDs, PhDs, statisticians, and various professionals. It is considered crucial by all those involved that the protocol be followed rigorously during the clinical trial. Before and during the execution of the clinical trial, we send out monitors to the clinical sites, whose job it is to make sure that those sites comply with every detail of the protocol. A monitor will spend one, two, or three days at a site, sifting through records to verify compliance. Any minor deviation from the protocol is written up with complete transparency. The pharmaceutical company has to ascertain the impact and redo portions of the clinical trial if deemed necessary. All of this information is thoroughly documented in preparation for a potential audit by the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Intention or universal acceptance by clinical site staff is never accepted as a substitute for sloppy work. If the FDA finds serious irregularities, approval of the drug may be denied, which can cost the sponsor $100 million or more in sunk costs. Shouldn't the processes for governing God's church be even more rigorous than those required for clinical trials? Didn't canon law evolve out of painful historical failings? If there is a papal renunciation, shouldn't a commission of canon law experts be immediately convened to analyze the renunciation and document the events surrounding for any irregularities? Shouldn't they report any irregularities with transparency to the worldwide church? When Benedict XVI resigned, why did this not happen? When Cardinal Godfrey Daniels reported in his autobiography that a group of cardinals who called themselves the St. Gallian Mafia canvassed for votes and colluded to get Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio elected, in strict violation of known procedures for conclaves, with a penalty of excommunication for violators, why was this allowed to happen without any correction? Where was the Oversight Commission? Mother Mary, Queen of Heaven, in the Church-approved prophecies of Our Lady of Good Success, has provided the crucial answer. In the early 17th century, she told Mother Mariana, that toward the end of the 20th century, which is our time, quote, Freemasonry will then be in power. 
will enact iniquitous laws with the aim of doing away with this sacrament, referring to the sacrament of marriage, making it easy for everyone to live in sin and encouraging the procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the Church. Finally, this message jibes perfectly with her message in the Third Secret of Fatima, where she said, Satan will reign over the highest places and succeed in infiltrating to the top of the Church. So, it is reasonable to conclude that the Freemasons are in power in the Vatican, and that they deliberately or sloppily dispensed with canonical controls in order to get their man elected. Why bother with the irregularities? Just forge ahead as though everything was and is normal. Hence, despite various calls for addressing these issues, we see no serious attempt to do so. In fulfillment of Mary's warning, two iniquitous laws that do away with the sacrament of marriage are Bergoglio's acceptance of remarriage after divorce in Amoris Letteria, and two, Bergoglio's acceptance of contraception, the great destroyer of marriage. As Christians, we are obliged to read the signs of the times. We know by faith that Jesus will always be faithful and always give us a faithful shepherd as his vicar. It is no exaggeration, however, to say that what we are seeing is a strong sign that this man who many think is the Pope is not the Pope, because he does not act like someone who has received the gift of Peter's office. Events surrounding the papacy will continue to get worse. At some point when all seems lost, Mary promised to restore the Church, quote, in a marvelous way. As this disastrous regime unfolds, millions are praying for this to happen soon. She can fix it. We cannot do it alone. However, we can lay the groundwork for her eventual intervention by prayer, especially the Rosary, and courageous deeds. In the meantime, it behooves one to maintain allegiance to the true Pope. Maintaining allegiance to a heretic and a schismatic makes one a heretic and a schismatic. We will close with a prayer for Pope Benedict XVI. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, have mercy upon your servant Benedict your vicar on earth, and direct him according to your loving kindness in the way of eternal salvation for the entire Church. With your gift, may he ever desire that which is pleasing to you, and may he accomplish it with all his might, through Christ our Lord. Amen.